Welcome to another episode of Outside Shots. I'm here. I'm your host, Saul Booker. This is my man, EJ. Jump shot, A. Eddie, how are we doing today? I got a little sinus thing going on. I got to get on the road. Oh, no, that's not good. Yeah, but you know what? EJ knocks it out. <laughs> yeah, don't worry. <laughs> Things like that don't bother me, you know? <laughs> I feel like I got the kind of vessel that, uh, you know, I got a lot of great warriors in my in my body. They go to fight, man. Like, they enjoy it, I think. I think they enjoy for me to be under the weather. Then they can get to show their dominance inside they, they my body. They have something to prove? Yeah, stay out, you know? Like, yeah, so, you yeah. know, I feel them in their fighting. They're saying, Eddie, we got it under control. You might sneeze every now and then, but it's not gonna be a full bore, like, breakdown, so. You I'm, have, I'm enjoying the fight. I, you know what, Eddie? I, I, sometimes I wonder what it's like to be inside your head. Like the things you think about, it's just very unique. Well, I'm a unique individual, so I think it's taken you a while to figure that out. I, I've always known that. I'm a unique guy, man. You know, it's like, right. yeah, I'm always in a decent, good mood, you know, and so life is short. So EJ, 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 66, five, man. Like I'm getting close to my height. When uh, when's your birthday? May first, man. Oh, you, come on! You know it had to be first. Oh my God, this guy! Come on, whatever this month guy. it is, it's first. Oh it, I can't even say anything because my birthday's on the second. Yeah, well, you too. You're number two. You're May second. Uh, September second. Oh, September second. You're yeah, second. Yeah, That's yeah. okay. It's not. It's all right to be. You know, to lose sometimes. <laughs> you know, EJ always first. All right, EJ. Well, <laughs> uh, along with that, oh, Eric, where where is my where my where my chapters at? Where my where my my tiles at? We we agreed we were going with the tear because no, the tear looked like good. I, last week, a I, couple I, weeks I, ago, we agreed to go said, with the tear. Last week, I said I told the, the last producer because you don't show up every time uh, that I, I I didn't like it and I wanted to go back. So well, then you should have told me. You didn't I thought tell you me, knew, man. I thought you producers nah. talk all the time. So let me pull up my. You, my, you, my do you want me to make so it on the fly stay now? on track with what we're talking about. We we're talking about the Suns anyway. It don't matter. We'll start off with the Suns anyway. Uh, EJ, obviously, going back to Minnesota. First of all, do you even like Minnesota? Uh, I've never really gotten a chance to enjoy it because I'm usually there when it's cold. Okay. Last week, it was 70 degrees. Perfect. I uh, wish I had taken my clubs. So I said, okay, got five days there this time. Mm -hmm. Like, we're there. We leave today. And uh, I, don't like, I don't like to tell people my schedule. That's fine. I don't think they're going to be waiting Leave for you today, the play Tuesday. So we don't come back Tuesday night. And, you know, a few days off in between game one and two. Thought EJ could get a little golf in. Mm -hmm. Man, it's 40, 40 degrees. Is it really? Yeah. Damn. It's hard. It's hard out here. And you know streets. what? I could take the 45 <laughs> to 50 degrees. That's cool. But the sun's not out. Mm. So, you know. I'm not. I'm not. Trying. The entire time you're there, the sun's not going to be out. Uh, the first couple of days, I think it's cloudy. Man. Yeah. So DJ right. can't. DJ normally look forward to playing a little golf. I make a little golf trip actually out of it. I have some of my boys meet me over there. You know, mm -hmm. hang out. Do you play you like uh, the golf course by like Lake Minnetonka? I've or never played. Like that? I, that's what I'm saying. I've never played golf in Minnesota, so okay. I was looking forward to it. Okay. All right. Yeah, but right. can't do it. Well, can't do it. We won't have a game five, hopefully. So I can't say I'll do it next week when the weather is going to be better. Yeah, you know, you got to stay positive. You well, let's think it's not going to go five. Well, games. let's talk about that because I think this is a favorable matchup for the Suns. You've seen them play this Timberwolves team three times in person, and all three times they've dominated. Uh, the, the Timberwolves have never been closer than single digits in any of the second halves. And I mean, Ant has averaged less than 14 points a game and the average margin of victory is about 15. Like overall, like statistically speaking, from a dominant standpoint, the Suns have dominated this 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 run this year. Now, we all know that when you get to the playoffs, it can be a different story. But I think with this team, this particular Timberwolves team, I think they're going to be very much up against it 
because the Suns have all the matchups that are going to be favorable against their vaunted number one defense. And I just think this this plays right into the hands uh, of Devin Booker, Kevin Durant, and Bradley Beal. Well, their big lineup has struggled against the Suns, right? And and against every team, you're going to have a favorable matchup where you're going to get a better rhythm against them. And no matter what you do, it, it seems to be difficult for you. I think in the three games this year, uh, that's been the case. Uh, but, you know, this is a different animal now. They can game plan better. Uh, they know what the Suns have done to them this year, so they're going to be more wound up than normal. So it's a lot of positives, but it's also some potential negatives in that in that regard. So, you know, yeah, the, the big lineup for them is not a negative for the Suns. Uh, they can go small. They can move KD to center, and that forces Gobert to have to guard somebody small. Uh, and I think that's going to be an issue for Minnesota in this series. Now, if they get it going inside and we're not making shots, then we got issues because of their size and their ability to, you know, at least win the paint game with their ability to get to the to the to the basket. So, yeah, it's just going to be a chess match without a doubt. I mean, it's, it's basically you got to take the recipe <clears throat> that a lot of teams were trying to t- make the Suns take, which is pack the paint and force them to shoot outside. I think that's really the recipe yeah. because the, the Timberwolves don't – I'll just say this about the Timberwolves. They don't have a dominant low post presence that you can consistently go to to take advantage of. I think, you know, you really the, – the inside, the interior scoring is a lot by ant drives, lob passes to go bear, um, and then Cat every now and then will we'll get some positioning down low. But outside of that, there's not really a lot of dominance down low. And so you got to feel good about the if you're the Suns in terms of what you can do to this team. I also like the fact that they have held Ant relatively you know, low. And he's at, been averaging like 26, 27 points a game. Right. And he's only scored 14 a game against the Suns yeah. in the, because they've been trying to limit his drive opportunities to the basket. He's due, though. Right, and and he's not going to back up. He knows it, and he's going to come out extremely aggressive. Uh, I think that's when you can pick up quick fouls on him. So the Suns going to be ready for his aggressiveness to get in rhythm because he knows it's just talked about widely that he struggled against the Suns. So they're going they have to be ready. Look, I, I said this time and time again. If the Suns match the energy of their opponent, and they don't turn it over they have a chance to win every night. And then that's that's been the swan song for this team. They're going to outshoot most teams. Uh, that's not an issue. It's just they got to take care of the basketball. And the last time they played Minnesota, they not only took care of the ball, they forced them into a ton of turnovers. Yeah. I think 32 points off their turnovers. If the Suns do that to anybody, I don't care who it is in the NBA, they're going to win. Who's uh, the one player that you're looking forward to seeing in the playoffs on this Suns team that you, you're you just excited to see what they're going to be able to do? Again, I, I think you pick up role players because ultimately they're going to, if you're going to win a series, a role player is going to win one of those games. And, you know, I, 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 talk, I talk about that and I love that because, you know, from the middle career to the end of my career, I was that guy. Mm-hmm. And Drayson Allen, Eric, Eric Gordon, I think one of those two are going to have a hell of a game. Like, they're going to have one of them games that just knock you out. Mm-hmm. And I think that's what it's going to have to be because they're going to game plan against Devin. They've done it. They double teamed him last time, I think, out. Uh, teams are going to double team him. And so because of that, movement of the ball and it's going to fall into the hands of those guys. And they got knocked down shots. And I just think those two, those, the role guys, Bobo, all of them, that's what I'm looking forward to to see if they can really step up. Because if they step up, that's the difference in a close game and a blowout. Yeah, And I, I think that's going to be the key for the Suns in this series. And I expect one of those guys every game to step up. You got a guy like Nas Reed over there. You know, he might get thrown in the fire. And he's the guy that's not shy. You know, he'll take his shots. He shows energy. So it's just guys like that, man, whether they score two points or ten points, something that they can step on the floor – to do, get a steal, block a shot, take a charge. Whatever it is, that's going to add up to the Suns being able to win the game. I got a super chat from Cycle Blue EJ. I listen to you give feedback to players on both teams during your broadcast. As a player turned caster, I do this a lot as well. Do players approach you after the game for specific advice? Now, okay, so a little clarification. Cycle Blue, 
is a huge gamer. Like he is like top tier in the in the world in terms of like online gaming. Like he's what, like, what kind of games he's playing? I, I don't know. Like I don't. He the actually. Psycho, you, I don't you know you if play, it's like World play, of Warcraft okay, or. Okay, okay. You play. <laughs> you play Madden. You play Madden. Then you know. I think you might have an issue with oh, EJ. Oh, EJ, you don't want to go there, man. Listen, I, I want I, everybody. Listen, I'm man. on Madden. I'm on Madden. <laughs> I'm gonna tell you right now. I've been destroying people. Oh man. I'm serious. So I'm good, what, I'm, what I'm hearing right now is that EJ wants to join our Madden Football League. Yeah, that's what I'm hearing. There we go. Yeah, I didn't know that you on you, you you play Madden. Oh yeah, oh yeah, we all play. Oh well, well put me in. Oh, I got you. I, I got will you. freaking destroy uh, you. Psycho Blue says Street Fighter and Tekken. Oh, y'all, you into them shooting games? I'm not into them shooting <laughs> up shooting game. up people okay. games, man. <laughs> You know, games. I'm not into that. It's oh, boring, man. We we appreciate everybody else in the chat. I see Kevin there, uh, a bunch of other people as well. But no, appreciate he asked me ultimate. a question about yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, advice. I it it used to be the case uh, when I first retired uh, because I was transitioning from playing to broadcasting. I'm around a lot of guys that I was either teammates with or I played against, and so yeah. Uh, the fraternity always gravitates toward the fraternity and anything that you do. If somebody does something like you, you'll probably seek advice for them. And players over the years, the high level have done that. Over the years, though, last number of years, I've kind of backed away from it. Uh, and so I don't really, I can be quite honest with you, I don't see the team that much, even though I travel with them. You know, I sit in the back of the plane, when I get off the plane, they're already on the bus. When I get to the hotel, they're already up in their rooms. Mm -hmm. So I don't really, you know, the only time I really interact with them or I cross their paths is when we actually have breakfast. You know, we have breakfast in the hotel, uh, buffet that's set up for everybody, and then for lunch. So I might cross their paths mm -hmm. then. I might ask them a question about something. But for the most part, I don't. I don't. I think the only player that I think I've even said anything to this year was Bo Bo. And, and more so, I just said, just stay patient. And that's when he wasn't playing. Mm -hmm. You know, and I'll do that. I'll mm -hmm. go past the guy and say, hey, man, you're playing well. Do players ever come up to you when, like, maybe you're a little critical of them on the broadcast and say, hey, man, I, this is what was happening, or explain why, you know, they saw something a little differently than maybe you said on the telecast or anything like that? In the past. Yeah. I mean, players have come up to me. Uh you know, and, and I'll be ready to, you know, to respond if they think that I was too critical of them or if I said something. I would assume the approach is a little different because you're a former player versus like, let's just say like K Ray said something critical. I think the approach might be a little bit different towards him than it is with you because you played the game. Yeah, but I think because he travels with the team, I think they would still be respectful. Mm -hmm. uh, unlike me, when I played uh, announcer for San Antonio said that, you know, just put Eddie Johnson out there. He can't guard nobody. And I'm like, <laughs> and that that particular week, Paul Westfall stood up in front of the team and said, Cotton asked him who was playing the best defense over the last two, three weeks. Mm -hmm. And Paul Westfall stood up and said, Eddie, right? Mm -hmm. And then he showed tape. Like, you know, but you get that moniker and people think you can't play. So this broadcaster was saying that, and, I, and I'm a guy that watches all the tapes. I got like 80% of my game in storage. So, you know, I, Mike Woodson was visiting me a couple of weeks ago and he was talking junk and he didn't know that I already had queued up a video of a game that we played. <laughs> and he started talking smack. So I had, I had two TVs, so I had the TV on the final four and then he started talking smack and our families were all sitting there. Mm -hmm. I put it on <laughs> and showed him shooting the ball every damn time he touched it. It was hilarious. So I said, don't mess with me. I have tapes of every game. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, I, I would I would watch tapes and stuff like that. So I watched the tape of this guy ripping me. Man, the next game, I wrote a note out. And I, seriously, and it was really, it, was, it wasn't a nice note. It was a little colorful. I told him to <laughs> kiss my, you, you know, broadcast. And, oh, yeah, went at him. <laughs> and I put it, folded it up, and I put it in my sock. Uh -huh. It was in San Antonio. You played with him? Ran, ran, no, ran out for the game, and I was playing the game. I sauntered over during the, like the middle of the first quarter, reached in my sock, <laughs> took the note, and <laughs> set it right in front of him. That's a true story. Really? What did oh, he say? Oh, yeah, people, he didn't say nothing. <laughs> 
He didn't say nothing. I think the next game he commented on it that I gave him a note and it was very vulgar. Uh, I didn't say anything about his family member or anything. I said something about him. But, yeah, I've had players come up to me. Uh, one player came up to me. I'm not going to even say his name. And he called my room. Hey, I, Eddie, I can't. What, what, do you, what do you mean? What do you mean? I, I was injured. And what do you mean, you know, the team, you know, I shouldn't have played a lot of minutes when I came back. And, and you know, the team played well without me. What do you you know, and he went on, he went on, he went on. Well-known Phoenix Suns player. And he went on, he went on. I listened. And then I just said to him, I said, you know what? I said, this is the first time that you've ever called me. And he and I used to talk a lot more than, than the usual. Mm -hmm. I said, you call me to get on me about what I said critical about you? I said, how many times you called me when I freaking said all those nice things about right, you? Right, right. I said, now all of a sudden you gonna jump on that? Man, I, I treated him like one of my kids. I literally <laughs> kept him on the phone for about 45 minutes. Oh no. That's what I used to do to my kids. I oh, say, no. I, I used to tell my kids, you want a spanking, right? Now I know people out there be like, hey, Eddie, you was abusive. Uh, let me tell you something, I was raised by a mom that put belt to my butt, yeah, okay? Same, same. You don't like it, too bad. Look how I worked out, <laughs> okay? So it's either spanking, belt, or you gotta sit in my office and I'm gonna talk to you for an hour. Wow. You know what they started to take? <laughs> what? The belt. <laughs> <laughs> they they, really get they it over said it. it was pure torture. Oh my goodness. That I would sit there and talk to them for an hour. Damn. And I would. Damn. And so that's what I did. I kept him on the phone. And I'm telling you about the time he got he he, he walked up, he said something to me two weeks later. He said, Damn, man, I ain't calling you no more. <laughs> <laughs> I'll, I'll say this, man. You know, I think you made a good point about you know, even on our son's show, we've been, you know, we've been critical from time to time. Everybody's been a little critical of this team from time to time because of the inconsistencies and stuff like that. But damn, man, yes. I, I For every negative thing you might say f about a player in terms of what they're doing in the moment, there's probably 50 other things that you've said positive, but they, that doesn't matter. It's always about the negative. Yeah. It's always about the bad thing. You're making me look this way or whatever, right? And it's just, yeah. it's unfortunate. But uh, Victor Vic, we are live, by the way. You asked uh, if we were live or this is pre-recorded. We are live. We're always live. There's very rare occasions where we be pre-recorded. So um, outside of that, uh, obviously, you know, this is a big series. They get past this, they're, you know, the sky's the limit, really, because they're going to have that that confidence. You got Denver in the next round or the Lakers, and the Lakers are playing really, really good. I'm not going to – I don't know if Denver's going to sweep them like they did last year. I'll say that. Uh, they're they're playing very well right now. So it's going to be exciting to see what, what's going to happen as we move forward to the future. And in the future, you can go to OG's Brands and get yourself a nice little gummy, a little sativa, a little indica, a little RSO. Uh, you know, that Rick Simpson oil can do, a, uh, do you wonders, uh, make you feel good. Uh, cure some of those aches and pains right now. My knee is a little swollen. Yeah, my ankle's swollen. I don't know why, man. Do you ever just wake up swollen for no reason? Well, my ankle's sw swollen up on me. So there you go, yeah. yeah. I, I, I I got out of the arena last night and I was just like, why does my knee hurt? And I had to walk another mile to my car. Why so. did, what, how did, when did it hurt? When you did what? Nothing. No, I'm saying, it? but I mean, just standing still? It just was walking, hurting? yeah. You was walking, stop walking. <laughs> oh, wow, okay. All right. Well, uh, I'm not going to Get a wheelchair, walking. Saul. I'm not going to stop on. walking. I mean, well, I uh, mean if it only hurts when you walk, stop walking. I'm not going to stop walking, uh, but maybe I'll take an OGs in the future to make myself feel good so I can just ignore the pain. I don't know. Uh, you can go to OGsBrands.com, find a closest dispensary to you to get the best gummy in the game. Uh, the Sleepy Time edibles are pretty good, too. So check them out, OGsBrands.com. And remember, you must be over the age of 21 to enjoy. All right, Eddie. Um, as we move forward, two things I want to talk about. One, let's start here. This egregious take by Mike Greenberg the other day, and I'm sure you've heard it, but I wanted to get your thoughts. Let's play the clip first. Don't win tonight, because then you walk into a buzzsaw. Do you ever see the movie Fargo, where, where, where Steve Buscemi winds up on a wood chipper? That's what going into Denver to play the Nuggets is. Just the end of your season immediately. 
So Mike Greenberg in that moment, this is before the Lakers played the Pelicans on Tuesday, said that the, he thought the Lakers should tank the game so they could get a favorable matchup against the OKC Thunder uh, by playing whoever would win that 9-10 game, which was ultimately the Kings, which is – it just goes against every competitive – fiber in your body it doesn't make sense it was probably one of the worst takes i've ever heard i don't even understand that perspective it definitely feels like a non-player perspective uh i know you've heard this i was very curious to hear what you were going to say about this because i did not hear your nba radio satellite show yeah. uh on sirius xm radio every day from two to five see let me take another swig of my vodka. W- one to four or two to five uh well one to four it's, now. It's one to four Pacific yeah, okay. time. All right, there you go. So, uh, let me take a look. Nobody wants to hear box. that on on the on the audio, Eddie. <laughs> Just tell them what you think. <laughs> no dog on well. It's not vodka. It's tequila. But uh, <laughs> uh, I like Mike Greenberg. So do I. I like them on Mike and Mike. <clears throat> I missed that show, but he he and Mike didn't get Mike didn't get along. Uh, I like his show now for first take. Uh, get up. He's the ultimate water boy. <laughs> it was disgusting what he said. Like, and again, when I say water boy and couch potato, I think water boy really in general is not a negative. Couch potato is a little negative. That means you got to get up and work out. But he's a water boy because he has not one competitive bone in his body. He's a guy that would actually, you know, be okay with, I believe, you know, cheating in the game. I would never play golf with him. I think he'll find every way he can to win in an indirect way. I I, I just – that comment <clears throat> just blew me away. So you're telling professional basketball players – you're telling a team that LeBron James is on, a guy that has made a history of going to the finals, and only one person has gone as many finals as him, well, a couple of people, Bill Russell, Sam Jones, I believe. All right, that's it. You're going to tell him to lose on purpose. You're going to tell him to actually try to make it easier for him to win. Knowing that if he did that, and you all suspected that he did it, you would destroy him. Yes. Come on. Like, LeBron knows what his legacy is. No matter how you look at it, it's okay. Is he and MJ. However you look at it. That's already in stone. That is not going to change. Unless Wimbenyama, somebody coming up behind, right, Mm -hmm. uh, is going to knock him off the throne. So he knows this. So if he loses... Yeah, people will say something, but he's 39 years old going on 40. Like, he has a built-in, already earned excuse. Would you agree? Yes. So why not roll the dice and see if you can be great and legendary more than what you are? Like, that's the goal, and that's why they needed to win that game. That's why they need to play Denver again, a team that's beaten them eight straight games. Mm -hmm. Swept them last year. They need to play them. And guess what? He's coming with a much better arsenal than he has from last year. That's it. So I'm going to tell you right now, it's not going to be a sweep. I think it's going to be a close series. I think the key player in the series is D'Angelo Russell. I think if D'Angelo Russell can somehow, some way close to match Jamal Murray, Denver's in trouble. Oof. I mean, he, if he can, if right? If he can. If he can. That's the key, right? So I'm not saying he won't go south, but I don't know if they got the, uh, uh, the number of defenders that, that's going to be able to stop him. Yeah. Okay. Contavious Caldwell Pope is going to be all over the floor guarding different people. So D'Angelo Russell is going to have his opportunity. And I think he's the key to this series for the Lakers. The Denver bench is the key for them. And it's a bench that's not as strong as it was last year. Yeah. So no, I mean, come on, Greenberg. That that to me, he's looking for clicks, man. That's all he's doing, saying that. 
You know, it's, he's typically not a, a a clickbait guy. But he was looking for one there because he knew yeah. when he said that you promoting a team lose on purpose. I mean, come on. Psycho Blue has a has a super chat right here, and he kind of lays it out as well. He says, "So where would Fargo Buzzsaw Bashemi fall on the Bashemi scale?" I don't, I don't do the Bashemi scale. These guys do. That's an Espo thing. You can ask him. I'm just not really. I don't really know much about that. So uh, Zion and Butler yeah. injuries are why you go all in wherever like your seed to avoid plans. Let me address that. Go ahead. Because, one, I have to apologize for one. I sent a tweet out last night. Yeah, about Jimmy Butler. Yeah, but yeah. I sent it out before I actually knew what his diagnosis was. So it was before the game. I mean, not before the game. Before, you know, it was like right at the game ended. Mm -hmm. And then I sent it out. And I got on him. I'm like... You know, you call yourself playoff Jimmy, but you're really, you're playing Jimmy. You're not playoff Jimmy. Mm -hmm. You got to play into the playoffs. And I said, if you took care of business during the regular season, you wouldn't be that way and you wouldn't be limping right now. Okay? And then like, I don't know, about eight minutes after that, they came out and said he might have an MCL. So it didn't look good. Right? <laughs> I, I would have to admit, the tweet didn't look good. Did you delete it? But I, I, I well, I deleted the tweet, the tweet, but I also wrote another one of why I said it. Mm. But I added the apology at the end because if I had known that it was an MCL, I wouldn't have probably mentioned anything about him limping. Yeah, right. So I mean, I can admit when I'm wrong. But you're not wrong about that. I'm not wrong at all about the, the re dude regular season. Val he doesn't value the regular season. He admits that he doesn't. Okay, he called. He accepts the, the the nickname Playoff Jimmy, and to me, George Carl, Larry Brown should always say, Eddie, if you ump with the game, it's gonna ump with you. Yeah, and it does. Like you and people are like, well, well, you know, well, the Suns, one of the, one of their players could get hurt in the seven games. That's fine. That's fine. But you know what? It's it's less. It's one less game. Like he he has to play two he had to play two extra games if he can play right mm -hmm. so he's playing in a playing game when it's pretty much assured that if they played hard during the regular season and he played they would be a four seed so that's my point you got to be proactive man you got to close your eyes and look to the future and say you know what if I did this this can happen if I did that that can happen and that's what I'm talking about with him. Like, I mean, you gotta, you, you don't want to be in the play-in. Like, if the Suns had to be in the play-in, you know what I was going to make reference to. Three losses against San Antonio, mm -hmm. three losses against uh, Houston, mm -hmm. a bad loss against Portland. Like, that's why you play the game in the regular season. And Jimmy Butler doesn't, man. And so I, I, I felt a little bad about I, the timing of my tweet, but not what I was saying. Yeah. No, 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 no. I, I can't stand that playoff, Jimmy. Man. Playoff Jimmy. No, play during the regular season, man. Take everything serious. And I don't think he does. And it's unfortunate now that he might not be able to play uh, for a while. And that's probably going to cost the heat because, tell you what, if Kobe White played halfway as he played last night, they in trouble. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, listen, man. That again, that's why you got to play. You got to play hard, and you got to you got to play all eighty-two games if you're if you're healthy. And that's, <clears throat> you know, listen, man. I don't know if it's this this day and age of player that is just trying to coast because they think they have everything and they don't have anything to work for, and they can just coast to the playoffs. And then once they get to the playoffs, they can turn it up. But I just, I just never been on board with that. I just like you said, like if you if you f with the game, the game's gonna f with you, and um. Yeah, I, I just don't like it. But let's move on to something that is also a little, I don't even know how to put this in context in terms of how I feel, but I think it's a little sad that the the dynasty is over for the for the Warriors because I do believe it's over. Um, you said? I mean, it, you know, it, it, let, me, let me just say this. When I look at Klay Thompson, I know Klay Thompson and, and, and Booker got into that little thing last year, but then he came out and he apologized because he's, and he even said that he was he was acting like a baby in that moment. Like, to see Klay Thompson basically have his career taken away to a certain degree because of the ACL and then subsequently right after that, the, the Achilles um, and him never returned to the form that he, he was at really. 
is a little it's a little sad to see that because it was you know the game was taken away to a certain degree and he could never really find it again he still he was still a good shooter but he wasn't nearly as as hot and as elite um and as consistent as he used to be and and that's a little sad i'm not sad about draymond green whatsoever and i'm and, and i think you know steph is always a guy that's easy to root for so that dynasty um, if, if they were the Suns, I always say, if they were the Suns, we would think that they were the greatest team of all time because of the way that they, they went about their business, the way they won championships, the class organization that they are, and all that stuff. So um, it, I think in that regard, you can respect what the Warriors have done and, and understand that that and then acknowledge that that period of time is over. I'm not sad. Okay. I, Steph and Clay, two of my favorite players in the history of the game. Love them both. I'm not sad. Why? They was dancing on top of people's heads for the last seven, eight years. Yeah, no, I get like, that. You don't be, look, this is just sports, man. Like, it's between the lines. You're not sad that they lost. Uh, I think Clay can still play. Clay is just now immersed in a role because of his age, because of his injuries, where he can't do it every night. But Clay can still play at a high level. I mean, that 0 for 10 game the other night was bad, but up until then, over the last month or so, Clay has been playing lights out. So Clay still has it. He's going through some emotional stuff that most older players go through uh, where a coach starts to look at them differently, starts to play them differently. And you go through this adjustment, man, this mental adjustment, which is not easy. And Clay obviously carries his feelings on his sleeve. Mm -hmm. So you, you know that he cares a lot. And but I, what I would tell Clay is welcome to the club. Now, Clay, here's the great thing about it. You're still playing. If some guys only get 10, 11, 12 years in, they don't even play anymore. So they don't even get the experience, the oldness that you're going to experience in this game. Just because you're not playing as much as you want, getting all the shots you want, people still want you. You still can play. You just can't play at a high level like you used to. Mm -hmm. And once you come to that understanding, you're better for it. Like, and so everybody's going to go through it, man. If you play, I would say, 13 plus, if you get to that 14th year, you're going to start to find out that they don't view you like they used to. They're not going to play you like they used to. They're not going to give you the rope like you used to have. They're going to, somebody's going to be on that bench that's younger, faster, stronger, and he's pushing for your minutes, and he's going to get some of your minutes. But Jimski got his minutes. Mm -hmm. That's a part of the adjustment as you continue in your career in basketball. The hardest part is to hold the guy off. I remember when I was a young player and I got into the league and I was on an older team in Kansas City. Man, I couldn't get to I couldn't wait to get to the gym to bust up them old dudes. <laughs> like just try to destroy them, man. And that was back in the day when I was dunking. Like I'd be in there dunking hard on them, going at them. Cause I was hungry. Like I wanted what they had. They're driving to the, to the practices with Mercedes and living in big houses. I'm in a freaking apartment. Mm -hmm. and you driving, like, what were you driving at the time? Uh, Riviera. <laughs> I, like I want, and they were talking about me cause they had a Riviera, Riviera looked good. <laughs> but you know, like being able to go to the store and buy more expensive clothes than me. I watched that and I'm like, I'm gonna bust them up because I want what they got. Mm -hmm. But Jemski went after Clay like that. And guess what? He won some of his minutes. But that's all right because Clay's older. He can still play. And so, you know, that adjustment is hard, man. It's hard. Everybody goes through it. Mm -hmm. It is not selective. If you love the game of basketball, and you love how you used to be treated on the court and play, it's gonna bother you when yeah. you can't do it at the high level you used to. And you're gonna go through it. And that's why I truly believe, and I, I don't think Clay will do it. Uh, I think he needs to leave. You think he needs to leave? Oh, yeah. leave uh, Golden State. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah Because yeah, if he's sure. searching, if he's searching for that feeling of like what it used to be, it's not gonna be there. No, no. That kid Pajemski can play. Like, so it's not gonna be there. Like Looney is feeling it. Remember Looney was getting all those minutes. Yeah. Trace Jackson straight gangster them. Like, 
if you want to recover those memories and those feelings, you got to do it somewhere else, Clay. Trust me. EJ took his, took his skills over to Europe to get that feeling. Again. Mm. You know? That's why I went. I went over there. I was the man. Yeah. You know, in front of covers, you know, magazines. I was. I bring them here. You can see them. I mean, I'm <laughs> on variety shows. Oh like, I couldn't even walk around town. They're like, Eddie, Eddie. They call me Magic Johnson. <laughs> Eddie, Magic Johnson. I turned into Magic Johnson oh over in Greece. I'm telling you, that's what they called me. That was my nickname. <laughs> I'm driving to the game. They drive by, Eddie. Eddie, we love you. <laughs> Man, you know how good I felt to feel that. It reminded me. <laughs> it reminded me of how it used to be when I was in my prime. Yeah. Playing yeah. here in Phoenix, and they meet us at the airport, and we beat the Lakers, and they just love you. Like you search for that, right? Like drug addicts always say, I search for that that next big, big, big high, right? And they get addicted and they search for it. That's that was my drug. I went over there, man, please, walk in the restaurant. Oh, Mr. Johnson, what do you want? Ah, I sit over there. You know, go to VIP in the club. They didn't even open the club, Saul, till I got there. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Saul, you can ask Rolando Blackman. We'll bring him on this show. he tell you, EJ was huge over there. We, I'd call the club. Clubs didn't open in Greece till midnight. i say, hey, we're coming to your club tonight. We get there. Thousand people outside because they've announced it and blared it all over Greece. We pull up. I pull up in my car right in front. Get out like you know MJ or Magic would do. <laughs> like right, open the door and everybody. Oh, 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 yeah, what's happening? You know, take a few pictures. Go in. Go in. In the back of the club, VIP roped off. Got got kamikazes on the bar. We sitting back there, man, it was like me, Thurl Bailey, Orlando Blackman. I mean, we were all playing on teams in Greece. Mm -hmm. Man, we sitting back there like, yeah, yeah, this is how it's supposed to be. This is the life, <laughs> you know? That's what Clay's searching for. Yeah. But he's gonna search for it here. And in order to find it here, it's not gonna be in Golden State. Do you, uh, I'll throw two things at you. Clay, CP3, could you see them on vet minimum contracts at any point? And if so, who? Clay? Yeah. No. Okay. CP3? I, well, CP3 maybe. Because I think there's two different things there, right? Clay is still viable. He's just got to get to a team that needs him, right? He's got to get to a team that needs him and not expecting Clay Thompson, right? And to just be in a situation where he can do what he does, run the floor, come off screens, knock down shots, and and be okay with it, mm -hmm. right? So that's that's what he needs, and he's got to me. Clay's got three, four more years of doing that, okay, in the NBA. So he should get paid for it, okay. Now Not at the high level that I thought he was expecting when he turned down the extension, yeah. right? So, but yes, I think he can. He still to me. Uh, 12 million, 15 million a year player. I do. I what? think that in the right environment. Sure, sure. Okay. Oof. Chris, Chris is at the end of his career, be 40. Uh, you see him coming back to the sun? He, I can see him being interested. I can see him being interested. I think he still has the, his house. I can see him being interested. Uh, I think Chris ultimately, this is my opinion, I think he's wrestling between whether he wants to coach or he wants to go on and just do his businesses that he does. Mm -hmm. I think I think in the, in the I think he wants to coach. I just think it's in him. Yeah. And I think whatever team gets him, I think in the future that could be their coaching waiting. Mm. I do believe that. Uh I just I think he's that ready to coach. Uh and he knows the game tremendously well. He has the energy to do it. Uh and he's not afraid to you know, be con confrontational. He just has all the ingredients, I believe, to be a tremendous coach. Well, you can have all the ingredients to uh, have a good weekend coming up. Somebody asked, uh, where's the barbecue on Saturday? Uh, the barbecue does not exist, but we are having a good time out there at Chicken and Pickle. 
Uh, and they do believe, I do believe they serve Four Peaks. And Four Peaks is uh, one of the best craft breweries in the state. You can go check them out. Uh, we also have this unique event. Uh, I wouldn't say unique event, but listen, I know you all know what's going on with the Coyotes. And it's really sad what happened in their last game last night. And, you know, our PHNX Coyotes crew has done a fantastic job of trying to harness that community in one spot and, and do everything they can to uplift them. Um, and they want to do one more get together uh, next Wednesday. And it's called One Pack, a celebration of the Com Coyotes community out at Four Peaks. Uh, if you buy a ticket for five bucks, those proceeds go to the Arizona Kachinas Youth Hockey League. Um, and, and, you know, those, those kids really, really need the support and we're here for them. So it's next Wednesday, the 24th, 7 p.m., out at Four Peaks Brewing on that 8th Street Pub. Uh, check it out. It's a, a fantastic uh, opportunity to hear some stories. We're going to have some former players, uh, some other Coyotes uh, people out there, and, uh, you know, it's going to be a good time to kind of get together, but that's at Four yeah. Peaks. You can get some you can get some peach ale. You can get some kill lifter. You can get some, some wild reed. There's going to be some drink specials out there, and, um, and Eric's about to put the link in the chat cause I did send it to him and I appreciate you for asking about that. Stephen Weiss. Uh, I try to do what I can, you know, I can only do so much on this side of the, the, <laughs> of the screen. I'm giving Eric a really hard time. I'm putting today. it in the description of the show too, man. But it's okay. Um, so I got you. Anyway, you go to four peaks, enjoy that, uh, that beer and, uh, it make make sure you re enjoy responsibly. Uh, I feel like we can't go. Can I say it about the coyotes? Yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead. I, I I've been a part of two cities that that I played in that lost their team. Okay, Kansas City, mm -hmm. and then Seattle. Mm. And all I have to say is I think when you lose a team, I think everybody has to look in the mirror. Mm. And wonder if they did everything that they could have done to make it not happen, right? It's not just ownership. Sometimes people just look right at ownership, or they'll look, you know, <clears throat> or they'll look at the politicians. No, no, no. It's everybody because the only reason that politician is in office is because of you. So, did you show the effort when you saw this going on? to really galvanize everybody to march in front of his office or whatever it, what, what it may be. And I'm not too privy on how it all transpired. I knew they were looking for a place to play. <clears throat> uh, but everybody is responsible when you lose a team. I, I, I truly believe that. I've seen it. Like, I could have done more in Kansas City in regards to talking because I was, like, one of the top players on the team. And I could have done better. Uh, in Seattle, I think we could have done better. And and so I think everybody plays a role in that. And I think everybody has maybe it's a small role or big role, but to force that from not happening because it's suicide. Like, it's going to be hard to get another one. You know, and I'm not saying Phoenix can't get another one, but then you get another one and you build a damn arena. And you have one. That's what's happened in Seattle. All of a sudden, they didn't want to build the arena. Then they left. Now they built one. Mm -hmm. Kansas City, same thing. You just said empty. They built one. Yeah, they use it for events, and that's it. <coughs> so I, you I, can't I, wait to after the fact. I will. I will push back a little bit because uh, I, I I don't think that in this, <coughs> in this case, listen, ownership here in the Valley with this organization has been a cluster F since day one. Um, they've had multiple opportunities, the ownership group specifically without the, the, without the, the voters being involved. And, and there's a couple of situations where they even passed like the Los Arcos deal, like the voters passed that multiple times. It's the ownership group that effed it all up. And then you get out to Gila river and it's all kind of a jacked up situation out there. And then the, the ownership group that takes over right now. And I'm listen, man, I, I, I I'm just going to say it, man. It, from the start, it felt like they were disorganized. I've seen it myself. I've seen it. Hell, if you just follow the social media account, it's kind of a cluster. It's all over the place, man. There's no pulse on what's going on. There's no perception or reality about the situation itself. And I think it just run it. It ran its course. And when they didn't get the Tempe vote, 
Um, and that's the citizens of Tempe specifically. Only the citizens of Tempe could vote on that because it was only a Tempe related thing. Uh, so no, none of the other people that really support this team had an opportunity to vote in that. So that's a very, very important distinction. In addition to that, the, the marketing campaign that the Coyotes ran was absolute trash. They didn't even get involved in really pushing the message out until like the last month before the vote. And that was by that time, people had already made up their minds about what they wanted to do. So I do think as an organization, they had more to do with their own demise um, in terms of the organization itself, the ownership group, not the organization, the ownership group of their own demise than anybody else. And so there, yes, there are opportunities where fans can do a little bit more to get involved and really support the team. I agree. But in this instance, I just don't see that being the case because it was so heavy handed from the ownership group. And when they proved that they could not get things done in a timely manner and they had multiple opportunities to do so, they came up short at every single turn. And so that's why, you know, and, and listen, these things, nobody's going to be able to tell me that this thing wasn't in the works for months. It just, there's, I'm, they I, had refu options, of I refuse you, to believe you that. You always have options. And we just hear this two mind. weeks ago before the end of the season. Like, that's just, you always have options. That's just man. terrible. You always have options. This is terrible. Yeah. Go ahead, Eric. It, it's also how they've treated the employees, too. Yeah ownership like it's not like they've taken it on the chin and been upfront and, and and honest like i know people who work over there and they were left in the dark for so long as well and some of them still are it it it, it is a really really bad organizational look and i'm sure that there's some percentage that a lot of people play where it comes to fan support or whatever but we have such a rabid coyotes fan base it's like just because they were down for a couple of years, like rebuild wise, that that should never lead to to a relocation. Yeah. So sometimes you just think, man, like you get you get content, and that's that's why I think the teams left Kansas City and Seattle is this people got content to think, oh, it's just going to work itself out, mm -hmm. and then they don't do their part, even though it could be small, and they don't think it's powerful. But if you get a hundred people doing a small part, it becomes big. And I just think with, with professional teams, you just can't roll the dice. Like you can't ever take it for granted that it's gonna work itself out. Because I've just seen so many disappointments in that happening. Yeah. You know, and so when you have it, right? It's almost like marriage, right? You okay, you got her, she's still in your house, right? <laughs> She's still right there. She's not a hostage. Right? <laughs> no, what I'm, I'm making she a point, can't right? escape, the windows are blacked yeah, out. She's still there. <laughs> So you have every opportunity to make it right. Mm -hmm. Once she leaves the house, now it's hard. Yeah, I get you. Because you got you got to go find her. Sure, sure. So it's like, and that's what I'm saying. So the Coyotes was in house, and <clears throat> I just based on what I had read and seen, it didn't. It jumped up on me because I didn't. You know, I'm I'm a hockey fan, like you know, lower level. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm a Blackhawk fan. I follow the Chicago Blackhawks. You know. Uh, multi champion Chicago Blackhawks. Uh, Not today, Eddie. Just keep going. <laughs> well, I'm just I uh, follow okay. them. I'm from Chi Town, you know. I mean, that's I never say Bulls. Okay, all right, right. Even though I'm from Chicago, uh, so yeah, I, that so it's tough. It's tough. I feel sorry for the Coyote fans. I, I've seen the response and. The disappointment. I've seen. And I've seen the support from the Coyotes fans. That's why I push back on it a little bit. Just because going to those city halls, going to multiple government get-togethers to try and speak, and, and people being able to speak their voice into keeping this team here. There's such a p passionate group, and at every turn, I don't know if there's ever been a a, a group of fans, a fan base that has been drug through the trash like this fan base ever yeah. in any other city, any other sport. Like I just 30 years of getting the, the short end of the stick time after time after time. And it yeah. felt like since day one, the tease of, Oh, well they might leave Phoenix or they might leave Arizona has always been there. And this is really unfortunate. And yeah, I don't want to dwell on it too much no, because we got is. other things to go, but um, yeah. It is. I just wish that, you know, obviously, you know, Suns Arena could be able to house hockey, but it's not configured, no, obviously, no, uh, no. for hockey. And I just wish that was the case uh, because, yeah, you, you, man, like 
the bravado when you talk about your city. We got four. Yeah. We got four professional teams. And now, you know, only three major professional teams. But I, I truly believe hockey is going to come back here. I, I hope so. Oh, somebody's going to move here. Are you kidding me? It, you got organizations right now looking. Listen. And they know they're going to get everything they want. Like, that's how it works. I want to say yes. But look at L.A., okay? That's a, that's a perfect example. Uh, it took them 20 years to get football back in L.A. after yeah. they lost the Rams and they lost the Raiders. Yeah. You know what I mean? So it's not a foregone conclusion that this is going to happen anytime soon either. So that's, that's the scary part about all this. So, yeah. I mean, we could talk all day about, about you know, the scenarios here in Arizona. Well, but we talk about everything. We'll, 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 that's how we roll. We'll finish it up with that's this. That's how we roll. Um, I feel like every other day, Caitlin Clark is in the news for multiple reasons. So I'm going to give you your pick of what you want to talk about on this particular thing. So you have... Kaitlyn Clark and her contract and how low it is. We have Kaitlyn Clark and that weirdo um, asking that creepy, uh, doing the creepy gesture um, during the, the press conference yesterday, Greg Doyle. Or we can talk about how she's got a huge lucrative uh, eight-figure deal coming from Nike while Asia Wilson, two-time MVP, two-time defensive player of the year, two-time world champion, uh, doesn't have anything. Which one would you like to talk about? No, we can talk about that. Uh, listen, we all know. Like, she got that contract because they believe she's going to make them a lot of money. Yeah. They're no, not giving her that. Like, Asia Wilson, tremendous player. You have a lot of tremendous players in WNBA. But it's, it's about marketing, man. And let's just face What's not it. marketable about Asia Wilson, though? Well, it's not... It's not like there's nothing marketable about her. Is that they don't have to go out of their way to market Caitlin Clark. Why is that? Well, two reasons. One, she is an unbelievable basketball she player. She is. I'll give you that. She, the timing was correct for her playing in Iowa, okay, a school that normally is not going to be up there with the you know top-notch women's basketball college teams. Sure. Uh, it's how they play. Uh, and let's face it, man, it's how she looks. And there's nothing wrong with that. Like, you know, I tell people all the time, you know, NBA games, you go on NBA games and, you know, 80%, 85% white Americans are there in the stands. They would love to see somebody on the court that looks like them play at a high level. It is nothing wrong with that. I grew up in the inner city, uh, and I would look for people who look like me to see if I could get a job like them. If I saw a black pilot, I'm like, oh, okay, Ooh, I can become a pilot. If I saw a black lawyer, I'm like, oh, you know, I could become a lawyer. Like, you identify with people that look like you, and there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, that's not racist, that's not anything, it's like, People that look like you, people that struggle like you, whatever kind of environment you want to fall back into and how somebody made it. And, and so they're going to pay because they want to see her succeed in a predominantly African-American sport. And that's okay. Like, I don't have any issue with that. I'd be a hypocrite if I said, oh, it's about that. No, because I grew up wanting to, like, gravitating towards guys that look like me. Like, and I wore number eight because I love the way Marcus Johnson played, mm -hmm. right? Uh, you know, and I've gravitated toward white players like Kiki Vandeweghe, very good friend of mine, actually taught me the nuances of footwork. Went out of his way, went from nine points a game to 20 points a game. Kiki Vandeweghe helped me do that. Purvis Short helped me do that. I picked up so much stuff from Larry Bird, you know, and his trash talk and all of that. Like, but fans, they would love to go to a game and they would love to, you know, like they come there with their kids and their young ladies that they want to play basketball. And they see out there that most of the players out there are African-American and that white young lady might, I don't know if I could play. And she sees Caitlin mm -hmm. and she like, oh, I got a chance. And you know what? Fifth Avenue is picking up on it. And they're going to they're gonna blow it up. 
Now the pressure's on her. She's got to live up to that. As Larry Bird had to live up to it, right? You know, the biggest insult I think, you know, people got when we used to always say, Larry Bird play like a brother. Mm-hmm. I don't want to hear that. <laughs> no. Like, no. That's a guy that, you know, rarely we haven't seen him. No. And I get it. So it's like, you know, people sometimes they don't want to talk about that issue and those issues, but it's not anything negative. It's just perception, man. And right now she has the perception of galvanizing Fifth Avenue, uh, being the talk of the WNBA. But guess what? She got to live up to it. And that's and I feel for her for I, that. I, I really, truly feel for her because I love her as a basketball player. I am telling you, this young lady can play. She man. can. She can. She has a tremendous feel for the game of basketball, man. I mean, uh, passing, just, you know, it's everything. And so <clears throat> I'm looking forward to seeing her journey and to fight through what she's going to face. Because I am telling you, they're coming after her. Oh, yeah, her. no, she got to turn and it on her back for sure. She's gonna DT's have, already ready. She's <laughs> going to have to come with it, man. I'm just telling you, man. Did you, so, did you hear DT's uh, comments about Caitlin Clark? Who? The broadcast? Tarasi. Yeah. Yeah. I Did you have any problem with it? I didn't. <sighs> Look, you got to prove yourself. This, this is a pro- – college is one thing. The, M- the, M- the WNBA is another. Like, you got to prove yourself. This is not like – you got to show that you're worth what they're saying. Yeah. And of course, Diana Taurasi to me is the is the is the greatest female basketball player ever. And the reason she got it is not just strictly on talent; it's longevity, it's her winning, it's the combination of everything about her. And because I can throw in Cheryl Miller, if Cheryl Miller never got injured, Cheryl Miller by far would have been the best ever. She got injured. Cynthia Cooper, okay. I mean, Cheryl swoops. Yeah. We can we can throw down a lot, you know, and there's a lot of tremendous players right now in the WNBA. So, no, I have no issue with what Donna Taurasi said. Uh, you know, obviously the timing wasn't right for people that didn't want to hear it, but Caitlin's going to have to prove herself, man. And and I honestly, Saul, think she will. Yeah. No, I get you. I get you. Alan J says, uh, talk about the Suns. The playoffs are more important than a three that shoots threes. We did. We did for like the first 25 minutes of the show. So sorry, buddy. You can go back and watch that. You got to use you as relaxing with your OG. (laughs) I'll say this about Kaylin Clark. Like, listen, I'm not mad that she got the bag at all. I think that's fine. What I'm saying is, is that, you know, that Asia Wilson is marketable. She's got a, she's on the New York times bestseller list. So clearly when, when she speaks, people like to read or listen to what she has to say. Um, I think the WNBA, listen, you know why major league baseball sucks is because they don't market their stars. They don't do a very good job of marketing their stars. Market the team. They market the teams and that doesn't really track as well as it should. You got to market stars because people want to come to the games to watch you know, it's special talent. Okay. The WNBA does a pretty good job of, of showing off their stars, but I think that they do a poor job of, of, of showing off the diversity and the, and the plethora of stars that are in the WNBA. I think they only focus on a few, not saying it's only the white players. I'm not saying that at all, but like in Asia Wilson deserves to be marketed at a higher level than she is. Right. She, she is, she is, she is worthy of that recognition. Uh, now, if her personality is the thing that keeps her back or whatever, like, okay, that's subjective. But I do think that when we're talking about uh, the way that uh, a player uh, plays the game at a high level in a sport that is growing consistently, and she's known as the best women's basketball player in the moment at the time, and she doesn't get recognized as such uh, from the marketing standpoint, but is by her peers and the league and other fans that watch her on a day-to-day basis, I think there's something inherently wrong with that. So I would like to see Asia Wilson, uh, a player like Asia Wilson and a player of Asia Wilson's caliber, get that kind of recognition because we're giving it to a player who's been awesome in college, but she's 
we don't know if she's going to be the best player in the WNBA. We saw Kelsey Plum break the, the NCAA scoring record as well before, and she got into the league, and she was okay. She's okay. She's a good player, but she's not an elite player. She's not like the top tier, one of the top 10 best players in the league. And I'm not saying that's going to happen to Caitlin Clark, but you know, you got to crawl before you walk. And I know that Nike's taking advantage of the marketing opportunity right now because her name is huge right now. And it is huge for yeah. a reason. Like she has captured America's attention in a way that no other woman's basketball player has ever done before. I will say that till the cows come home, yeah. but, but that doesn't mean that players like Asia Wilson, if Brianna Stewart and, you know, Sabrina Ionescu, who has never won a championship before, um, like get rewarded as well because of their name. I would argue that Asia Wilson is just a big name as Sabrina Ionescu outside of the fact that Sabrina Ionescu has got a relationship with, 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 you know, the NBA and shooting in that three point contest and her, her journey through Oregon and all that stuff. Like I get it, but I do think Asia Wilson is up there uh, on that level. I give you another great example. <clears throat> Tiger Woods. Tiger Woods went to an all white sport. Yes. And he took it to an insane level. Now all those golfers are making hundreds of millions of dollars. Not just thousands and millions. They're making hundreds of millions. If it wasn't for Tiger, it wouldn't be any live. It wouldn't be live because those very guys that made their money in the PGA got the attention of live. Mm-hmm. That's all Tiger, because Tiger put the PGA in position to make so much money when he joined that it raised it to an insane level. That's what Caitlin can do. Like, Asia and all of them can't do it. They've been there. They haven't gravitated toward them. They're not going to change. When Magic and Bird came into the NBA, they raised it to an insane level. Mm -hmm. The players that were there were just as good, but it was too late for them to raise it. It's the newness of Caitlin and the eyeballs that's on her that's going to raise it. So all those players in the WNBA that's mad right now, they're going to be apologizing to her if she takes off. If she lives up to what she is supposed to, they're going to love her. Because she's going to be the one that's going to raise their salaries. Because they're going to get a TV deal because of her. But what, but what I'm saying is, to, to your point, okay, when Michael Jordan came into the league, he was, one of the, he was the first player to get a rev share of his shoe, right? No other player had ever gotten that, right? But that was based off but, of Magic and Bird. But what I'm saying is, but Magic and Bird had deals. They had deals yes. with Converse. So why can't Asia Wilson have a deal while Caitlin Clark takes it to another level? Well, Magic and Bird came in, and they got a deal, but they weren't making a ton. You remember Magic signed a contract with the Lakers, $25 million, yeah. over 25 years? Yeah. Wasn't making no money. <laughs> I mean, it was a lot of money based on the other players, but it was the worst, one of the worst contracts ever. So they weren't making a ton of money. I mean, like, and then MJ came in, and then MJ grew it more, and now all of a sudden these players start getting $80 million deals. Mm-hmm. So that's what I'm saying. So all these like Asian, all of them, they're getting good gym shoe money. They're getting good sneaker contracts. But the fact that she just signed what she signed, and obviously it was eight figures, guess what? If she plays at a high level like she's supposed to, then other players are going to have a chance to get it. So it, it, it had to take somebody special to get to the WNBA to lift it up, and this could be the person. Okay. So I would just tell the WNBA players, don't be negative toward that. Like, she is the catapult for you. Forget about it. Just like hope and hope that she plays to the high level that she can yeah. because she is the one that can put you on the map and get you that big-time TV contract. So that's the part that I think they, they might be losing sight of. And they got to be careful with that because she's not going anywhere. Yeah. No, she ain't. Well, that was an interesting turn. I like that. Uh, Frank has a super chat. Hey, EJ, why is there so much water boys on Twitter? <laughs> they ain't got nothing else to do. 
<laughs> like seriously, they ain't got nothing else to do. Like I said, Water Boy is not a huge negative for me. Like, couch potatoes. Couch potatoes. Are the I've seen too many couch potatoes sit there and screen record. They sit there and they talking. Just, out of context yeah. quotes and try to bury people. They're sitting on the couch. Fuckers. Tell, <laughs> crit <laughs> criticizing, criticizing guys running up and down the court when your lazy ass laying on the couch. Yeah, please. Bless their heart. <laughs> Well, hey. hey, folks, we appreciate you all joining us on another episode of Outside Shots. Uh, follow my man, Jump Shot 8, on Twitter and on Instagram. You can follow me at Saul underscore Bookman on uh, Twitter and Instagram as well. You can follow the show at PHNX underscore Sons. Uh, Mike B, it's not always about race. It's about equity. So stop with the bullshit. All right. We love y'all. Peace. <laughs>